Good evening, this is Peter Helland with uh, the show called Israel, and the subtitle there may say C.I. Schofield, and we're going to, I'm going to try to give a little background on <coughs> C.I. Schofield's um, reference Bible and how that, <coughs> what's in his footnote, has had a big impact on the country. Um, there's very few biographies on C.I. Schofield. This is one of them by David Lutzweiler, uh, who's associated with Moody Bible and worked for A.W. Tozer. Um, his family, he had a lot of family that was very close to <coughs> um, the uh, Schofield and Moody um, uh, background. Um, now Lutzweiler starts out with a kind of a theme here and he says, um, no less an authority than the late great A.W. Tozer, who watching this might know because he's from Chicago and he was considered like one of the top 25 Christians of this century. Uh, Tozer testified that as a young convert, his first biblical studies involved the Schofield Reference Bible. And John Mark, who some people watching may know, he's one of the most influential preachers in the country. Um, said, I think his, his dad and his grandfather were uh, dispensationalists, which is another word uh, for followers of the theology of C.I. Schofield. He says um, <clears throat> he was raised on nothing less than um, Moody Press and Schofield's notes. There's a joke about that. Um, Tozer says, as, as Tozer puts it, he was weaned on the Schofield Bible. Never, nevertheless, Tozer eventually came to reject its Darbyite theological system of dispensationalism and Zionism and stated on more than one occasion his opinion, quote, that one of the greatest spiritual disasters ever to hit the Christian church in the 20th century was the publication of the Schofield Bible. <clears throat> now, what I have here, I left my, uh, the original Schofield at the, the restaurant, but I have the new Schofield study Bible here. So when I, um, the Bible that I was given back in the early 70s by a pastor was the Goldfield Reference Bible, which is um, a little bit different, uh, but it, uh, it was one of the most influential books of the century. Uh, you combine the original, the new Schofield, they... Some people could argue that these two are the most influential books of the 20th century in America. So it, it wouldn't hurt to have um, knowledge about what, what, are, what is in the footnotes. Now the original Schofield was tr strictly King James. By the time this came around, you had the um, New International Version. Let's go to a, a typical footnote <coughs> that Schofield has. And it's basically the theme throughout his whole, um, his whole uh, Bible. Now, this is out of uh, Genesis 12, 3. And this is one of the, uh, for dispensationalists, and I use the word, most people that are dispensationalists have never even heard the dispensationalists. It's a, it's a theological term. Um, a, a dispensationalist, as John MacArthur says, is somebody who makes a distinction between the Jewish people and the Christian people. And a, a dispensationalist would hold, and I think it originates with John Calvin, that the Jewish people have a, a blessing upon them. Uh, now they have a blessing upon them, and there's also promises yet to be fulfilled for them and just and just for them, that would be um, a, a basic definition of uh, a dispensationalist, and would add that what that what they have in the future is an actual kingdom, a, a thousand-year kingdom that that where they will rule the earth with Christ from Jerusalem, and um, a dispensationalist is that. And that, that has created a revolution in Christian um, relationships with the Jews because up till um, this way of thinking, which has started with the Puritans and then Schofield, then 
radicalized it. And up till that point, Christ Jews were considered um, the main enemy of the Christian church. They were the ones that crucified Christ. Uh, they were the ones that stoned Stephen. Uh, Peter and Paul referred to them um, as contrary to all men and always trying to prevent the Christian from spreading the gospel as the main force of people uh, stopping the Christian from spreading the gospel. And even John Calvin was the, probably the fiercest enemy of the Christian, but he still maintained that there is this blessing. And I think Calvin was um, unique to all, all theologians in maintaining that. But then you had other theologians followed up, like Karl Barth, they, they would say that. Uh, but let's look at Schofield's main idea here in his footnotes. <clears throat> uh, Genesis 12, 3. And the Lord, the Lord had said to him, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, the, the, the footnote that um, it's in the New Schofield Bible uh, goes further than what C.I. Schofield actually says in his original. But here, here it says here, in the footnote, promises to the Gentiles. I will bless those who bless you. Genesis 12, 3. Those who honor Abraham will be blessed, and whoever curses you I will curse. This was a warning literally fulfilled in the Israel's persecutions. It, ha it has invariably fared ill with the people who have persecuted the Jew, and well with those who have protected him. For a nation to commit the sin of anti-Semitism brings inevitable the future will still more remarkably prove this principle. Um, you can find book after book. Uh, here's a book, um, as, as America Has Done to Israel, uh, the result, massive national disasters. In other words, he, he's going through page after page, pointing out one natural disaster, and, and, and he says, this natural disaster here corresponding with a bad foreign policy by America. So every time America had a, had a negative foreign policy regarding the Jews, God hit America with a natural disaster, whether it's an earthquake or a hurricane. And he's got a whole book. This is John McTernan. He's got a whole book. Um, I've listened to his argument on, on DVD. You can, uh, it's going to be on the internet. Uh, and this is just one of many books. That Here's another one, um, Wars and Rumors of Wars, Iran uh, and Israel, Mark Hitchcock. He has uh, the same theme, that if, if we mistreat the Jews, God uh, punish us. Um, here's another one, God's Promise and the Future of Israel. Um, so they, they constantly go back, and, they, and it is a going back to actually Schofield originated the idea, I mean, when I say original, Nelson Darby from Britain originated this concept that there's two peoples of God. God has two separate peoples, the Jewish people and the Christian people. And the key to the Christian people is that if they bless the Jews, then God will bless them. But if, but if they don't help the Jews and fail to bless them or even curse them, then uh, they'll be cursed. And in fact, they take uh, the, uh, Matthew 25, where it talks about the sheep and the goats. Uh, Schofield uh, takes that and declares that the sheep are not individuals and the goats are not their, their nations and whenever a nation fails to treat the Jew right then they are like the goats and they'll they'll go to hell and you got you got some people say the nation or individuals in fact they'll go to hell so it, and you go to hell not because of how you treat the least of these my, Jesus said, what you do to the least of these my brethren, that means people in the faith, you do as unto Christ. <coughs> Schofield takes that and says that's referring to Jews, because brethren means his physical brethren. Now, <coughs> <coughs> one way to see, test the spirit to see if what I'm saying is true, and I'm not assuming, because I'm saying you're, you're saying it must be true. No, this is something that I think it's worth worthwhile for you to get on the internet and to uh, explore this. 
Um, <coughs> if you want to go into let's look, look, he starts out not not only with what um, Sco, uh, he taught Schofield taught, but he goes into his um, his character. Now, um, <coughs> so there's one section here, um, but <coughs> Schofield's biograph biographical entry in Who's Who. Now, um, who's who, you don't really hear people talk about who's who as much, but when it was a, who's who was, a, was for only really successful, popular people. And who's who would, would have a condensed form <coughs> of who this, what this person had done. And, um, and it's always submitted by that person. So C.I. Schofield submitted his resume in a very shortened form to the who's who. A book, so it's obviously <coughs> it's it's prima considered fact. Well, if you look at what Schofield <coughs> submitted, you see so many lies, and that that raises the question because the, the most influential book of the 20th century, the two books, the New Schofield uh, Bible and then the original by C. I. Schofield. It, it has these big introductions where, <coughs> um, let me see here how he does this. And it, it starts out with <coughs> the people who wrote it. And there's all these doctors, okay. Um, <coughs> editor, C.I. Schofield. Okay. Now the new one has, um, for example, has um, Frank, uh, one, two, three, four, eight. Uh, presidents of universities. Now here's one, Alva Mc, J. McLean, Emeritus, Grace Theological Seminary. Grace Theological Seminary was founded <coughs> strongly on C.I. Schofield's notes, as was uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, a guy named Schaefer started it, but he was a mentor to C.I. Schofield, and you can, you can still hear Schaefer's sermons. Um, basically saying that the greatest teacher that he thought on the earth was C.I. Schofield. But when you look at C.I. Schofield, and when you, when you hear the fact that there can be such thing as false prophets and false teachers, Jesus is constantly warning us about for false teachers and false prophets. Now, if you look at C.I. Schofield himself, <coughs> And I don't want I don't want to be dogmatic, but for sure, in my opinion, he would he would be a false teacher. And let me let me explain possibly why. Here's what he submitted to who's who. Now we can also go into what he submitted to the Presbyterian Church because he was a Presbyterian minister, which also had similar um, <coughs> abbreviated bi biography. It says here, Schofield, Cyrus Ingerson, clergyman, born Lenawee County, Michigan. It's up by Adrian, Michigan, August 19th, 1843, reared in Wilson County, Tennessee. No, there's a lie. <coughs> and there's lies throughout this. He was not reared or raised in County, Tennessee. He moved there one or two years before he joined the Confeder Confederacy. He moved down there to live, in, live there with his sister. He, when his grandfather died up by Adrian, Michigan, his grandfather was about 94 and interestingly was a, um, a soldier in World War, in, in American Revolution. When his grandfather died, he was about 16, then he moved down to live with his sister in Tennessee. He submits to the world that he was raised in Tennessee. Now why? Well, <coughs> He joins the Confederacy. He's raised up here in Michigan, but he had no problem joining the Confederacy, and he fought all the way through um, <coughs> the Battle of uh, Antietam. Okay, now he, here's what he submitted, and <coughs> the contention of this book is is that, that <coughs> history always wants to say that he was a drunk and then and then converted. This book is arguing. There's really not much evidence that he was a drunk. There's evidence that he's a, a complete habitual liar. And he was thrown in jail and prison many times for forging notes to make money. Okay, so here's what he, he submits. He says this. 
And just to remind you, the reason we're going into this, that this fellow wrote <coughs> the footnotes for what for the, the became the most influential book, perhaps the most influential book of this of, of the 20th century. And there's up there's millions of copies that were sold. I've heard figures saying there was eight million. I've heard three million. I guess that's something you're going to have to, to go. Um, there's a Schofield reference Bible everywhere, and I'm. I'm <coughs> apt to believe that there are eight million that were sold. Um, so it's privately fitted for college, but university, st university studies interrupted by breaking out of civil war. Well, that's a lie because he, there's no evidence he ever went to school, but he might use like homeschooled. Or there, there's no evidence he went to anything past high school. Um, he was privately fitted for college, but university studies interrupted by breaking out of civil war. There was never went to a university. He did become a lawyer, but lawyers were self-taught, like Abraham Lincoln. Um, he married Hetty Van Wart of Ypsilanti, Michigan, on July 4th, 1884. That's a lie. How is it a lie? Don't forget, Abraham lied when he said Sarah was his sister. Now. Sarah was his sister, but he still lied because he wanted the impression that he was not married to Sarah. Sarah was his half-sister, and he was married to her. He's <clears throat> trying to give the impression here that he's never been divorced. Well, Schofield was right after uh, the Civil War. He married a French lady in, in St. Louis, <clears throat> and they had three children. And he abandoned her. <coughs> and during the abandonment, he's thrown in jail and forging notes. He wrote up, he wrote up a, more, a false mortgage note to steal money from his, his uh, older sister, from um, his wife's mom. And um, so he writes in here, he's married to Hetty Van Wart. Well, he and it fails to say that he had to, to, he was divorced. Uh, right before he married her. In fact, he says the marriage was July 14th, 1884. That's not when he was married. He was married three months prior to that. He just wrote that in there because it was going to look suspicious if, if he was married right after the divorce. So he lied there. Uh, and then he says, uh, Private with Company H, 7th Tennessee Infantry, May 1861, to the close of the Civil War. That's a lie. Um, he did not serve in the Tennessee, um, the 7th Tennessee Infantry, was the war. He quit after the Battle of Antietam, which was 1862. He put in a, a letter requesting that he be allowed to leave because he said, I'm really a northerner and I'm, I'm sickly and, and I'd like to, and they did, they did let him go. But he lied and said he fought to the end of the war uh, then he lies again, and he says uh, that he served in, ar the, ar in, in the Army of Northern Virginia under General Lee. Well, he's lying because he's trying to give the impression that he served directly under General Lee in some fashion. Well, everybody that was in the Army of Northern Virginia had Robert E. Lee as, in some fashion, over, over them. Then he lies and, and awarded Cross of Honor for Valor at Battle of Antietam. That's a lie. The Cross of Honor was something that was given out in about 1900 by the Daughters of the, um, of the Confederacy. There's an organization, uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy, um, created a purely honorary award, a general expression of gratitude for every soldier who had served the South honorably. But Schofield wants to say that that medal that he got, that everybody got in 1900, that he got for uh, uh, fighting in the Battle of Antietam. So he lied. Um, he says he was admitted to the Kansas Bar in 1869. He was a member of the Kansas House of Representatives from Atchison and, and, and Nimaha, Nimaha Counties, 1870 to 1871. He was appointed U.S. Attorney for Kansas by President Grant, 73. He was only 30 years old, or 29. He's one of the youngest. Uh, U.S. Attorney Generals of any state. Now, <clears throat> what he hides there is, is that he only lasted six months 
and then by Ulysses Grant because he had uh, a habit of constantly lying and forging notes and, and, and uh, cheating that they, he had to flee the status and run to uh, St. Louis because he was doing that. So he only lasted six months. <clears throat> So you don't. So he gives the impression here that you know that that appointment lasted a lot longer than six months. Then he has here converted religion at St. Louis in 1879. Um, there's a real problem with his conversions. Um, some stories have him uh, being saved. Uh, women came in to minister him while he was in prison. Um, that was the kind of the original idea how he got saved. That was the more popular one, um, or known one, because that's probably what really happened. But he didn't want people to think that he was in jail or in prison. And so he, they fabricated the story that he was in the office of some well-known Christian lawyer, and the Christian lawyer led him to Christ. And that this was happening while he had a very, you know, good law practice in St. Louis. Well, the fact is, <clears throat> when this happens, when this happened, um, according to the research of this uh, author, he didn't even have an office at all going on in St. Louis. There was no office whatsoever. He had he had left it. So um, he is lying. There is a lie behind this. Um, it says. He lectured, he writes that he lectured extensively on Bible subjects in Europe and in, and in America. The Europe can't be really proven that I know of. Um, and then he says his home, <coughs> he has one home in Astulat, New Hampshire, and another home at the Lotus Club, New York. Now, he was a member of the Lotus Club for maybe 20 years, and the Lotus Club was a very prestigious New York club that had a lot of Jewish Zionists. And the conclusion of this author, and the, the only other book that I know that has, that's, that has somewhat of a decent biography on Schofield, both authors came to the conclusion that Schofield joined the Lotus Club because they liked his footnotes. These were Zionists. These were Jewish people in New York who were really pushing to have the Jews return back to Israel. The Zionist movement was huge, uh, especially in New York City, 1880, 1890, 1900. They were uh, working very, to, uh, the Rothschilds, to, to uh, reestablish the Jews back in their, in their promised land. And Schofield belonged to people like Blackstone. He belonged to a lot of Zionists. They knew that. And he had already let out that he, his desire was to write a Bible with his own footnotes. And you see, miraculously, in a sense, he, they hook him up with the printing press, probably the world's most famous um, printing company. And so Oxford, if you look at any Schofield Bible, they have the patent on the Schofield name. And it's called the Oxford University Press. They published, and he points out that in World War I, they would have gone under because the economy was so bad during the, the height of that war, and it was the Schofield Bible that saved them. Um, and he writes here, I conclude that when Schofield joined the Lotus Club, it was not for merely having a place to stay. He says, if someone had invited Schofield into the Lotus Club, the Zionist connection appears to be plausible, indeed almost the only possible explanation. What else besides pro-Zionism did he have to offer anyone at the club? In the years preceding 1900, both Schofield and the Zionist Club could have become aware of each other. Um, <clears throat> so you have all the Zionist connections who would have had uh, connections with the Oxford University Press, and unbelievably, boom, Oxford Press prints his uh, reference Bible. Um, <clears throat> he writes, Schofield certainly knew of Blackstone. Now, Blackstone was a, a very influential man out of Chicago, and the Zionist movement was starting to um, 
infiltrate a lot of Christians. And then with, with Schofield publishing his book, uh, by the time in 20 hit, you have now Philip Morrow, who <coughs> was somewhat of a genius. Philip Morrow wrote the briefs for the, um, the, the famous monkey trial in Tennessee, the Scopes monkey trial. Philip Morrow was a, um, they said, one of the best patent lawyers in the country. He's from New York City. And about the age 45, he was going to a th uh, theater on Broadway, and he heard some singing way down the street. <coughs> it was kind of a, what you would call a hillbilly type church. And he was about the opposite of a hillbilly, but he went there, heard the gospel, and he got saved. Completely different than those people. But in Christ, uh, it doesn't matter your background. You know, I mean, when you want your soul to be saved, and you feel the call of Jesus, you're going you're gonna to respond. As was popular at the time, became a follower of Schofield. Schofield's already, his book, his teachings are already very popular. But after about 10 years, he wakes up and he realizes how wrong that teaching was. <clears throat> and Philip Morrow is probably one of the best uh, critiquers of the danger of C.I. Schofield. <clears throat> um, let me do that from C.I. School, uh, from uh, Philip Morrow. <coughs> and you get an idea of how dangerous this can be. And he was hoping it was going to be stopped. This is, he's writing 1821. But it, it wasn't stopped. And in fact, Schofield's teachings swept, have swept through the country profusely. Uh, Morrow writes, It will be readily seen, therefore, that we have to do with a system of teaching which, whether true or false, is of the most radical sort. Hence, if true, it is most astonishing that not one of the godly and spiritual teachers of all the Christian centuries had so much a, as a, a glimpse. And if false, it is high time its heretical character were exposed and the whole system dealt with accordingly. And inasmuch as it contradicts what every Christian teacher without a known exception, has held to be the indisputable scripture concerning the gospel of God and the kingdom of God, it clearly belongs in the category of those diverse and strange doctrines, against which we are specially warned in Hebrews 13. For it is undeniably diverse from what has been hitherto taught the people of God, and it is altogether strange to their ears. This I deem worthy of special emphasis, and hence would ask the reader to keep constantly in mind the fact of the absolute novelty of dispensationalism. Okay, now, let me just read what he's going to say, and then we're going to, what we're trying to do here is point out what Schofield taught and point out his character. Because they usually go together. <clears throat> it's kind of a maxim that if somebody <clears throat> teaches wrong, they're living wrong. It, I mean, it doesn't have to be. There's cases, there's exceptions to that, but if somebody is teaching a false uh, doctrine, you look closer at their lives, there's something morally wrong with their Christian walk, if they're Christian. Then, as to what this modern system of teaching is, <clears throat> it will be a surprise to most of those who love the Lord Jesus Christ that in respect to the central and vitally important subject of the kingdom of God, 20th century dispensationalism is practically identical with 1st century rabbinism. The, the rabbi, the Jewish rabbis, rabbinism, Jewish rabbis, what they taught. So he's saying what the Jewish rabbis taught at the time of Christ, the rabbis that uh, kill, uh, crucified Christ, the New Testament says they crucified Christ, what Scott is in his notes is the same, same doctrines. For the cardinal doctrine of the Jewish rabbis of Christ's day was that according to the predictions of the prophets of Israel, the purpose and result of the Messiah's mission would be the reconstituting of the Jewish nation, the reoccupation re by them of the land of Palestine, the setting up again of the earthly throne of David, and the exaltation of the people of Israel to the place of supremacy in the world. I just went to a, um, a Friends of Israel conference uh, this um, end of July in Winona Lake, Grace Theological Seminary, and, and they kept repeating that 
kept saying that the, the goal of history is the establishment of the thousand year reign where the Jews rule with Christ from Jerusalem. They rule the earth for a thousand years. And everybody is in submission <coughs> to the Jews and they were kind of making a joke about it that that is what's going to happen. That's what the rabbis taught at the time of Christ and they crucified Christ because he said no, that's not what's supposed to be and um, <coughs> the kingdom of God is um, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Kingdom of God is within you. You have to first, cl the kingdom of God is a place where there's no sin. And sin starts in the heart. So Jesus came to clean our heart and restore paradise where Adam and Eve allowed sin in. And when paradise is restored, there will be no sin. So Jesus came to die to clear up and solve the sin problem, not to set up some fantastic Davidic kingdom where the Jews held all the power <clears throat> over everybody else. <clears throat> now, seeing that a doctrine is known by its fruits, let us recall what effect this doctrine concerning the kingdom of God had upon the Orthodox Jews who so earnestly believed it in that day. And in view of what it impelled jealous men to do, let us ask ourselves if there is not grave reason to fear its effect upon the Orthodox Christians who hold and zealously teach it in our day. Now, Matt Eby comes on my show a lot, and he thinks, and he was grazed completely in this under Schofield teaching. He went to Moody, which is a Schofield um, church. He went to Wheaton, which has a Schofield background, and he went to Gordon-Conwell. He believes that 90% of the church, speaking for churches that are not Catholic, and maybe not Lutheran, not, or, not, not your, your mainline denominations, <coughs> or maybe just Lutheran and Catholic, but he thinks 90% of them, are drawing Schofield's notes in one way or another, which is radically different teaching. In other words, they've been Judaized. They're drawing off the, the, the thinking of the rabbis of the first century. Today, we are today, right now. Um, Matt um, has his Doctors of Divinity, and um, I'm trying to think. He, he was working on his Ph.D., he came very close to getting his Ph.D., and I don't know the, 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 the specific details, but um, Matt is very well learned, and so when he says something like that, he's careful not to be mistaken. But The effect then was that when Christ came to his own people, proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand, but making it known that it did not correspond at all to their idea of it when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, <coughs> and taught, that so far from being Jewish, it was of such sort that a man must be born of the Spirit in order to enter it. Then they rejected him, not, hated him, betrayed him, and caused him to be put to death. Okay, and, <clears throat> and Paul says that the reason that the Jews did that was, quote, because they knew him, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day. And furthermore, that quote, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Okay, and then he writes, This plainly declares that it was because the Jewish teachers had admitted the messages of the prophets that they were looking for the restoration of their national greatness instead of that which the prophets had really foretold, a spiritual kingdom ruled by Jesus Christ of the seed of David raised from the dead. Um, that is what most, if you turn on your uh, Christian radio, you're going to get David Jeremiah, <clears throat> you're going to get Chuck Swindoll, you're going to get uh, Vern McGee, um, you're going to get uh, Chuck Smith. And I grew up, <clears throat> after, I'm saying, after the age of 20, constantly listening to Christian radio. And I was oblivious uh, to how pro-Israel and pro-Jewish I was. Because, but, but I was getting sermons constantly and from pastors constantly. And most of the books that I read in book, Christian bookstore were reinforcing the idea that there's this blessing on the Jews or God's chosen people. And if you bless the Jews, you'll be blessed. Now, that came from C.I. Schofield. And when you look at C.I. Schofield's character, uh, you see that he had was a pathologic, he, he lied all the time. Um, <clears throat> he talks, here's the part on the doctor. He's, he's talking about, now how, how did he call himself Dr. Schofield? 
It says here, that first use of doctor, which later became specifically DD, is one of the many questionable aspects of Schofield's car career. There are, there are good reasons to conclude that his DD was self-awarded. He merely added his name. I mean, it's unbelievable. If you go to the hospital and you want to, I want to see Dr. Smith, you assume that he earned the degree. He just didn't declare himself doctor. Well, that is exactly what Schofield did. One reason is that no school ever has been found that awarded it. Another is that it was only in the previous four years that he had begun to write and publish a few things, none of which was remarkable enough to be recognized for such a degree, which is honorary. Still more, it seems virtually certain that the reception of such an honor would have been <clears throat> known to his church and recorded in its minutes. The certificate would have been preserved, framed, and hung on a wall wherever Schofield lived for the rest of his life. However, the church has no record of it, and it has been found. Finally, the most convincing reason, reason is the conspicuous absence of its mention in his entry for the 1912 edition of Who's Who. That entry contains at least nine days, like ones that we were talking about, demonstrably deliberate, that establish a pattern of de de deception. This pattern calls for discussion and explanation later. And he points out that in the Who's Who, where he found nine discrepancies, like <laughs> they're lies, uh, Schofield does not say that he's a doctor because who's who is, is um, <clears throat> too serious. That's a serious thing to submit something to who's who. And so the other nine, he figured he wouldn't get caught. But if he said he was a doctor, where he, you know, he'd have to say, well, where'd he get his doctorate? He can't just say, I'm Dr. Schofield. He never got it. It's self-awarded. Now, this country is entrusting it to the C.I. Schofield's notes. Um, what was interesting to me about C.I. Schofield is that <clears throat> for about four years, people didn't know where he went, and they thought he went up to Canada. And a friend of um, David Lutzweiler did a, um, <clears throat> a Google computer search on all the newspapers in the United States and to see if the name C.I. Schofield came up. And they found it uh, in the Milwaukee Sentinel. In, uh, in Milwaukee, and his name showed up several times in the Milwaukee Sentinel. In the Milwaukee Sentinel, I grew up on the Milwaukee Sentinel. The Milwaukee Sentinel was uh, probably the biggest paper in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Journal, Milwaukee Sentinel, the two biggest papers in, in uh, Wisconsin. And when I was younger, uh, I was a fanatical Milwaukee Braves fan, five, six, seven, and, and they'd have a happy Indi uh, Indian or a <coughs> sad Indian if the Braves had won or lost, and I only read the sports page. I didn't see any sense why anybody would read anything but the sports page. That's just how I th But for other readers, uh, you had local news. There was Horicon uh, in Wisconsin, Juneau and Horicon. They're two small cities. They're about 60 miles, <coughs> 70 miles from the Wisconsin, where I grew up in Wisconsin Dells. And for activities that were going on in Juneau or Horicon, the Milwaukee Sentinel had a little blurb on it. Like maybe here in South Bend, they might have something on Lakeville. And um, so in about 1879, Schofield gets arrested in Horicon. And that's because he, uh, for uh, vag uh, vagridge, um, for being a, a vagabond, for just loitering, loitering, loitering around. Back then in, in this country, and probably most countries, you could not just be bumming around. You, you, if you weren't working, you know, what are you doing in our town? You're just, what are you doing here? We're all working and you're just loitering around? Well, you could get arrested for that. Well, he was not just loitering around, he was chasing a female. And <clears throat> he told people that he owned uh, 1,600 acres on a, uh, on a plantation near Mobile, Alabama. Um, and that was put in, uh, in the paper, if I can actually find it here. Um, yeah, right here. Let me, let me just read this. It's interesting that they found this <coughs> on that Internet search. Okay, here, here's the story. The most important of those facts... Our newspaper accounts in Milwaukee, Wisconsin's Milwaukee Daily Sentinel from November through December 
1877 in August through October of 1878. Now, these articles report Schofield's arrests for swindles in Horicon and Juneau, two small towns northwest of Milwaukee during that time. These articles are indispensable for proving what Schofield was doing in those years. These were discovered only in April 2009 by Jeff Dunn, a researcher who used a search engine for old newspapers that was not available until recently. And he said, uh, Dunn is a friend of my brother, James Lutzweiler, who shared this with him. The reports are brief enough to reproduce the first that follows below from the November 29, 1877 issue, gives us the new discovery that Schofield sometimes used the alias of Charles Ingerson in carrying out his con games. We know that the Charles Ingerson mentioned in the account is our C.I. Schofield because his real identity was revealed later in the additional accounts that are quoted below. It shows that also that he was unfaithful to Leah Tyne, his wife, abandoned back in Kansas by carrying on a rom romance in his new location. Thus, that aspect of his character is consistent with the Patriot story of the later jailhouse romance with a mission worker in St. Louis. So he was a playboy. Here then is the first of the Daily Sentinel news items from Horicon concerning Schofield. So what was written about C.I. Schofield, the most relied upon man for scriptural knowledge of the 20th century. Dallas Theological Seminary was founded basically by Schofield. Schofield Bible was the, sort, was the background for that and then Schaefer, who was personally mentored by Schofield, is the, origin, is the actual founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, from which you get Chuck Swindoll, who's a past president. Um, all some great, powerful names come out of Dallas, and they don't want to know about this. <clears throat> Very few want to know about it, and Peter calls it willful ignorance. Here's what they wrote. A fellow named Charles Ingerson, who for two weeks past boarded at the Metropolitan Hotel, is under arrest for vagrancy. The fellow pretended to be the owner of a 1,300-acre plantation, I said 1,600, a 1,300-acre plantation near Mobile and was paving the way to a union with a fair daughter of the South Side when his career was suddenly brought to a close by the landlord of the hotel, Mr. Sam D. Maynard, who cared more to save the lady call him to account for the amount of the board bill. The Metropolitan Hotel is in Milwaukee, but the report is under the Horicon's Horicon News column because Schofield made that his base of operations. The closing comment of the report <coughs> above is explained by the later report of December 4th, 1877. Ingerson, arrested on a charge of vagrancy by the landlord of the Metropolitan Hotel, is to be set free. His affi you know, his fiance, affiance, settled his board bill and the course of true love will again run smooth. Two days later, under courts, is the notation Charles Ingerson vagrancy. <clears throat> Nole entered by the court. Nole contendo, a, a legal term. S Schofield, being a lawyer, may have entered that Nole plea on his own, since no counsel for him is mentioned at this time. A year later, as we see below, he does retain a lawyer in Wisconsin to have a warrant that was served on him there. This warrant was for one of the St. Louis forgery cases that still were pending from the years before he fled up to the Milwaukee area. <clears throat> However, his ability to get his vagrancy case to evidence from the subsequent reports. First, the paper reported on December 17, 1877. The fellow Ingerson, who talked freely of his large cotton plantations down, away down south, is again under arrest for vagrancy. He wheedled his affiance, his board bill at the Metropolitan Hotel, and has since managed to exhaust her pin money and the loose change of a number of South Siders. Um, <coughs> <coughs> they have a lot more on that, but let, let's not, we don't want to get into the whole thing. Let's just jump ahead here. Just to give you an idea that Schofield, more, you know, they want to say he was a drunk. What he was was a swindler, and his swindling as this author points out, was continued into his notes. And these are things people don't like to talk about because <clears throat> whole foundations, Grace Theological Seminary, is founded off, basically off the notes of C.I. Schofield. This is not something they want to have, want to discuss. And that doesn't mean people follow Schofield today, uh, like blindly. They've, they've, they branched off, but the, saint, the basic idea that if the Jews, you'll be blessed, and if you curse the Jews, you'll be cursed, and that God has 
<clears throat> special promises for the Jews who are not saved. There's a special blessing on them. And there's this future thousand-year kingdom that the Jews uh, are going to rule with Christ. Um, that's Schofield. And that is still there. Um, here's what the newspaper says. <clears throat> October 3rd, 1878. See, uh, Cyrus Schofield, alias Charles Ink, been hanging around here since the 1st of July, and who figured, and who figured conspicuously at the Metrop Metropolitan Hotel in Milwaukee a year ago, was arrested here Tuesday morning on a charge of forgery. Dispatches having been received by Deputy Sheriff A.E. Parties in St. Louis to hold Mr. Schofield until an officer should arrive to take him in charge. Mr. Hart lodged the gentleman in our county jail where he awaits the arrival of the Chief of Police of St. Louis. Four days later, on Monday, October, Goldfield's pass caught up with him again. <coughs> and this is again in the Milwaukee Sentinel. <coughs> Mr. Cyrus Schofield, alias Charlie Ingerson, was released from the county jail on Friday with a writ of habeas corpus, but under Sheriff End, immediately served another man and took him back again. An officer is hourly expected from St. Louis to take him to that city on a charge of forgery. Um... <coughs> We have here also an, an instructive exhibit for geography. When my very helpful uh, DPZ historian reviewed the first draft of this work in 2002, which was long before the Milwaukee Sentinel articles above were found, he pointed out that the, at the time that the Atchison Patriot Kansas appeared in 1881 was very suspicious. In other words, people were saying, no, we don't really believe it. And then out of nowhere, these articles in the Milwaukee Sentinel came in vindicated the author of this book he's saying so um, <clears throat> there's huge resistance to admit who who C.I. Schofield really was and you have to um, really press in now his uh, his, his divorce is probably the, <clears throat> the, the what really indicts C.I. Schofield because the Bible says if you don't if you do not take care of your own you're worse than an infidel and C.I. Schofield totally um, deserted his wife and three children. And that is completely on record. His wife um, lived to about 85 in Kansas, and the two daughters, the son eventually died early, but the two daughters um, lived also to about eight, age 85, uh, had, had a <coughs> apparently had a very good reputation, they themselves, and the wife pleaded with Schofield to come back she finally was forced to file a, um, a divorce, file for divorce, because he providing just a deserted and wasn't providing anything. Um, that seemed to work toward for them to be reconciled. Schofield would not be reconciled, and finally, she finally had to divorce. And right after the, the divorce, within three months, Schofield is remarrying, and that he tried to hide. And what this author points out is that by all normal rules of divorce <coughs> that Christians hold, Schofield violently violated them. And had people known at the time that he had been divorced and abandoned his family <coughs> and then suddenly remarries, um, and that he thinks, supposedly after he uh, said he got saved, that are writing forged notes, um, in, in wrongdoing, uh, he, he would have never been held. But what's interesting, even like Philip Morrow, <coughs> who's co constantly criticizing Schofield, he holds him in esteem as a, as a great attorney and um, great, you know, great past. And so it's amazing how in this country, after the Civil War, people could hide their identity. Just like uh, <coughs> President Roosevelt, uh, well, since, 19, since the 1920s, no one knew it. I mean, so how could you have a, a president who couldn't even walk and no one know it and be elected for four terms? Well, it happened. So it's how <coughs> you can be deceived. And, and um, <coughs> if you want to test out Schofield, who he is and what he taught, I would recommend to either the New Schofield Reference Bible or to his, his that was written in 1917, the original Schofield, and go to the intro to the New Testament 
and then both of them, they make a strong claim, which is a great revealer. He says this. <coughs> And the Old Testament is the introduction to the New Testament. And whoever comes to the study of the four Gospels with a mind saturated with the Old Testament four view of Christ, his person, work, and kingdom, will be greatly helped in understanding them. And then he goes on. Um, Therefore, in approaching the study of the Gospels, the mind should be freed so far as possible from such presuppositions as that the church is to be equated with the true Israel and that the Old Testament is to Israel and the four view of the kingdom relate only to the church. Interpretations are not true because familiar. It should not therefore be assumed that the throne of David is synonymous with the Father's throne, or that the house of Jacob is the church composed of Jew and Gentile. Now, <clears throat> what he's saying here is that the church is a brand new entity. That God has, God has the Jewish people, and then with the church, he, he's created a whole other set of people, and the two people are not to mix. And in fact, Schaefer at Dallas Theological Seminary following Schofield said they're not to mix for all eternity. The Jews are, are inherit the earth, and the Christians are called to inherit heaven. So he starts out right in his intro to the four Gospels, and he warns people... <coughs> Uh, that the mind needs to be freed. Uh, now, if you read Schofield's original, he said this idea that the church is e equated with Israel comes from C Roman Catholic teaching. And here they took that out in the new one. There's some big difference in the new Schofield and then the old one. But this is still... And, th and they really want you to understand that the throne of David is not synonymous with the Father's throne. Okay, so that Jesus, the, the core ideas of Schofield... <coughs> that has dominated Christianity today is that Jesus did not set his kingdom up, but it will be set up after the church is raptured. Then he's going to set up the promised kingdom where the Jews will run the world with Christ for a thousand years. That kingdom has not come. He is not sitting on the throne of David. Now, Gabriel told Mary, you'll have a son. His name will be Jesus. He will be given the throne of David and he'll rule over the house of Jacob forever. Gabriel on, on the surface, according to dispensation, lied to Mary. Because he said, Mary, you'll have a son and he will be given the throne of David. They say he was not given the throne of David. That is still yet to be in the future. So that's another strong point that you need to test this by. <clears throat> and, and the other is, is that Schofield says that Satan is not bound in this, at this church age time. But he will be bound uh, after Christ comes back and rules, puts his feet and rules Jerusalem, he will be bound then for a thousand years. But he, when Christ came the first time, he did not bind Satan. And yet all throughout the New Testament, it says Satan was bound by Christ. It says Jesus cast out Satan. Uh, it says judged by Christ. It says uh, the devil was destroyed by Christ. Uh, <clears throat> but Schofield concludes that he's, uh, Jesus... Satan is not bound, but he will be bound in the thousand years. The effect of Schofield's teaching is many. One he taught is that the regular church is, is going to go apostate. So you need to basically come out of the regular churches because they're, they're just professing churches, but they really don't know Jesus in their heart. That's a constant theme of a lot of radio preachers. Um, <clears throat> and the idea that, that Satan is... is um, not bound, that means Satan is now ruling, so it tends to create a defeatist attitude in Christians. What can we do? You know, Satan's ruling now. All we can do is just wait for Jesus to come back and somehow deliver us. But Jesus said, hold it here, I didn't leave you as orphans. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And greater works can you even do than me? So the old, the old way of thinking was, is, was very offensive. You know, we can take the land. We can do it. You had Joshua and Caleb having the positive report and saying, no, we can take it. Then the other, ten, no, we can't. Well, this teaching of Schofield, <clears throat> besides making Israel and the Jews our main ally, and salvation, in a sense, depending on how well we treat the Jews, besides that, it also has this idea, well, Satan's ruling. <clears throat> I don't know if we can really do that much. So what you see here is, is that the Christians have been 
retreating and retreating and treating in this country especially to the point that you can't mention Jesus in earth. You can't hardly do a thing and the devil's just just winning. A lot of people say it, it's, it goes back to Schofield's notes. Now all I can do is encourage you to look into this. You have the internet set out. There's a lot of books on it. Um, this book here by O. Palmer Robertson goes into um, Romans 11, 25, and 26. Some people say uh, it's pretty much all, it's all settled on those two scriptures, Romans 11, uh, 25, and 26. So uh, please look into this. <clears throat> and I thank you for uh, watching this show called Israel. And I hope uh, I've been of some help <clears throat> for you to test to see if they are of God. For there are many false teachers and false, false prophets out there. And you need to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. And I pray that you would uh, uh, do that. <laughs>